Welcome, welcome sisters to Return of the Priestess. My name is Dawn Del Vecchio and I am your host and facilitating priestess for this sacred global series. It is a joy to welcome you here. And I am very excited to share with you our speaker for today. Before I do, let us, however, really get grounded and centered so that we're available to receive the teachings, the blessings, the activations of our time together. So if it's safe for you to do so, I invite you to close your eyes now. And if you're able to, you can put one hand over your heart space and one hand over your womb space. And then let's just breathe a nice deep breath together. Coming fully present to this moment, receiving the breath and exhaling to allow yourself to release what does not serve you in this moment. And again, breathing in to come fully into your body, into your awareness, into this circle of sisters around the earth. And exhaling to allow yourself to let go. And one more breath in. Feeling the breath of life within you, the spirit in form. And then exhaling to come to your deepest wisdom now. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. And again, I welcome you. Today, we are going to be speaking about the role of the priestess in these times. And our speaker, Anaya Sophia, is an extraordinarily gentle and powerful woman. She's a mystic and a storyteller and the author of Revelator, Revelatory Wisdom. She teaches workshops throughout the world and is best known for the creation of Sacred Body Awakening, which I hope we will get the opportunity to hear a little about. Her recent book, Fierce Feminine Rising, reveals a map, a template that she was given for our human collective absolute awakening and the return to the heart. So today we're going to be speaking, as I said, about the role of the priestess in these times, which given all that's unfolding right now on the earth, it feels more than timely and actually crucial. So at the end, you're going to receive a priestess blessing transmission. And before that, however, let us get into this deep connection today. So welcome, Anaya. It's so good to have you here today. Thank you so much, Dawn. It's, it's really beautiful to, to see you, to hear you, and, and finally meet you. Indeed, indeed. I feel the same. So, Anaya, you have an extraordinary body of work, both in terms of your books, as well as your retreats, and just all of the podcasting and other messaging you're bringing forth. And it would be wonderful if you would share a little bit with our audience about your background and what brought you to doing this incredible sacred work you now do. I think the stage was set when I came into this world with my two parents. Um, my father was a uh, worshipful Catholic. So he was bringing in the passion piece the devotion piece, the, the love piece. And my mother was an atheist and she was bringing through the, the, exactly the same energy, but through the land. So she'd often take me to places like Stonehenge and Avebury, which were lo local to the family home. So I was very much introduced to the spirit of things at a very, very early age. And I used to watch the dichotomy between my parents because they would argue quite strongly over their beliefs. And I was never baptized. My mom would not allow me to be baptized into the Catholic 
faith. And of course, I got curious as to why. So I started to have uncomfortable conversations at quite an early age to really get to the root of why aren't you baptizing me? And why does that frighten my father so, so much? So I kind of got access to that mystical world quite early on. Yeah. Wow, what a story. I, having been raised Catholic myself and my, my elderly parents are still alive and very devoted, although not in a mystical kind of way, more in a secular way, I would say. But the, the sort of fear of not mm. baptizing, because yeah. I did not baptize my son uh, for my own spiritual principles, not atheist principles. Yes. And I know this was a cause of great distress for them. Yeah. Many novena candles have been lit, and f been lit for my son <laughs> over the years. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. That's exactly it, Dawn. It was the same thing. My father was Irish. He chose to marry an English woman. He was the first of the kids to do such a thing. So not only had he married out of, um, you know, the Irish clan, but also someone that wasn't following the Catholic faith. So there, there was an edge. There was an excitement in my childhood, but there was, there was an edge. And there was a dark cloud. And of course, I got curious as to what that dark cloud is and started poking and provoking and, and that is why I know that. That is why I have this sort of mystical appetite and flavor to my character. Mm, wow, beautiful. So I'm curious, did you ever spend a part of your young adult life kind of in hiding where you went to try and kind of conform to the mainstream or... Have you always just stayed on the mystic path? Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It was so strong. And of course, my, um, my zodiac is Capricorn. And I do have those goat-like horns. Um, and, and also, you know, my labor was long. So there's a part of me that really pushes. I, mm. I, I am a stubborn old thing. <laughs> I push. I put my head down. And I don't let up until that door or that way or that path has been opened. How interesting, because you ab absolutely have a, a, a prolific output of, of your work. Mm. So clearly you have that Capricornian just step by step by step up the mountain. Yeah. But that doesn't speak to the mystic piece. It would certainly be interesting to look at your chart at some time, the, a conversation for another time. <laughs> so, so let's dive into what the topic is today, which is the role of the priestess in this time. Mm. And, and given that as we are recording this, so much has unfolded so quickly since we first scheduled this time, yes. I'm, I'm very interested in hearing, as I'm sure all our listeners will be, to your insights, your mystical and perhaps your practical insights about the role of the priestess at this time? Well, I'll be really honest with my, my personal experience. I'm in France, so we are approaching our second week of complete quarantine. And of course, we've got France, uh, we've got Italy and Spain either side of us. And those two countries are the worst hit at the moment in Europe. So I must be really honest and say my first week of really coming face to face with this COVID-19 uh, wave that's coming across Europe, I was in shock. I was paralyzed. I was hardly praying, which is outrageous. But I know it's because my mind was coming to terms with something that our generation has never, never, never had to face. The last time something like this was happening, it was 1918 and the Spanish flu. And we've lived these really privileged and beautiful and free and abundant and generous lives. So when this first started to hit me, I had to just like lie low and just be incredibly human, <laughs> incredibly human. And I must say only in the last week, has that sort of priestess self started to rise within me and, and just touching the fringes of 
understanding the role that I'm going to be holding for myself and my immediate friends and family, which is a place of balance. One foot in one world, which is the world of light, one foot in the other, which is the world of dark, and no opposition, no judgment, but being able to voice both principles with the same amount of elegance, dignity, and reverence, and absolutely um, not going with the headlines, not going with the propaganda, turning to the dark goddess, the dark mother. And if I know anything about the dark mother, and that might be not point, not, 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 not one percent. <laughs> that is the work of the dark mother is very similar to this. It is initiatory. She will take us to two minutes to midnight. We will definitely have the impression that we are going to be absolutely annihilated that there's, there's hardly any hope left. That is her handiwork. And that comes because she is simply insistent on finding some bright light part of us that has yet to be lived. And so it's a real backing into the corner until sovereignty, authenticity, innocence and power and the good stuff it can only come by this level of duress and pressure. So that is what I will be holding. And if anyone wants to have a chat about that and where I live in the French Pyrenees, there's not too many people around. So that's my understanding for me of this role of holding right. energy. Mm, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the holding of space. And you've said some things here that I really want to tease out because they're so uh, aligned with the reminders for us in these times. You spoke about putting uh, one foot in each world, that balance mm. with elegance, dignity, and reverence. Yes. And of course, to approach the dark mother, knowing as little as we do about the ultimate divine reverence is essential and the dignity of our worthiness of that approach as well oh yes that's beautiful yes yeah, yeah. yeah. that it's not uh the old paradigm of religion that says lord i am not worthy to receive you you know that whole thing but the the recognition of truly our oneness with the divine and yet understanding that there is a greater movement here. Yeah. 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 It does feel very initiatory to me and many of the women and men that I am uh, in, in holding space for or who are holding space for me. Uh, and I love what you said about really going to that edge, digging deeply in order to access the light, and I'm looking down because I wrote it down, the light that has yet to be lived within us. Mm, mm. And, and to that point, and I'm curious your insights about this, I feel like what, what, we're, what we're feeling and seeing is an acceleration of frequency on the planet. And in that, those who have not been going deep within to... Um, to witness their own darkness, their own uh, shadow material, their own programming, their own conditioning, their own fears. Uh, it's coming up now in a very big way. This is something I've spoken about for several years. And I'm seeing already the projections, the, the anxiety, the fear, not just fear of like, oh my God, we're going to die, but actual anger and projections that are, are being put out, uh, out there. So I'm curious of your either your, your witness to that or perhaps guidance on how to navigate that for those who are like, I'm, I'm going to lean in and do the work and hold the space mm. anyway. Quite a lot of my background has been in the world of yoga. So I often look out through the eyes of yogic philosophy. And of course, it's uh, very apparent that coronavirus really impacts the lungs 
in a very rapid, there's like a rapid onslaught. It mm. goes from the throat to the lungs. So through my yogic eyes, we know that the lungs is where we hold our grief. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering in this time in quarantine that we might uh, take a little look at what could be in that heart, what could be impacting those lungs. You know, the doctors say the mucus hardens and it's very, very difficult to breathe. Well, what is it that got the mucus in there in the first place in such huge amounts? Mm -hmm. And again, yogically, we would say things like grief that has not been cried out yet, bitterness, disappointment, um, tightness in the heart, inability to breathe, inability to exist. So that's the sort of things I'm working on absolutely every single day. I'm, do, I'm doing something with a bunch of people at the moment called Vigil with the Dark Goddess, which is to really get into those lungs and, and get into that deep, deep grief, that, that, uh, that mourning, you know, the keening from the Irish tradition. Sounds, sounds that we never thought we could possibly utter because it's mm. going to be personal and collective. Yes, yes. This feels very deeply resonant uh, that there is the personal element and the collective element. And one of the things that I know right now I'm facilitating for others, uh, holding space for, is their experience of being projected upon by other people's wounds. Mm. And I've experienced a touch of it myself. And the recognition that we can't take it personally. Yeah. That we, when we are triggering, when we show up and we trigger someone else, if we know, if we're doing our work and we know we're showing up with love in our hearts, that it is part of this process we're undergoing. Mm. Thank you very much for bringing up the whole grief thing. You know, it's funny that that piece hadn't, hasn't come into any of my conversations yet. We've looked at the shadow, but that specific thing about the lungs and the grief element yes. and the, 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 this hardening of the, the gunk there. That's right. That's right. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. so I'm, I'm going to look into your, your sadhana. This looks really good. Although by the time this goes out, that will be complete. But my feeling says that there will be some other way that you are offering at that time for people yes. to explore. Yes, yes. Yeah. So I wanted to move on here because I came across something on your website. It's a quote that I would love for you to speak into if you feel this aligns. Uh, it says that you carry a message of remembrance of the feminine principle that throughout the centuries has preserved its spiritual dignity. Mm. Now, I want to frame this up a little bit because a lot of us who are doing, you know, living the rise of the divine feminine, especially those on for many years who studied like the witch burnings and many things, this is a bit of a radical notion <laughs> that <laughs> actually there has been a preservation of the spiritual dignity. So what, what would you say to that for us? For me, it begins with the mitochondrial DNA. There is a piece of DNA that only gets past mother to daughter, mother to daughter, and so on. Men have a little of it, but it's, it's negligible. For the women, for the female line, it's extremely strong. Now, this mitochondrial DNA can be traced back to Eve. And uh, I'm very much devoted to the stories of Sophia, of Isis, of Mary Magdalene. And so when I speak about this female principle, this, this remembrance, this is speaking to women who can connect inwardly to that mitochondrial DNA, to the fact that they are actually carrying original genetic material of that first woman that could well have been sent by the Holy Sophia herself, the feminine Godhead, 
who actually used Eve as an appearance of her true daughter, Zoe, who is both Eve and Lilith, so both a light and a dark form of the feminine principle, and that people like Mary Magdalene, Mother Mary, were women who remembered. So this, this lineage is sometimes it's lying low, no one's remembering much, and then there's a few who remember and then it lies low again. And again, you know, I just got to put it out there, this quarantine is the perfect environment to really, really remember. So this, it, you know, back in the earlier days, it was known as starfire women, priestesses who would give their blood knowing that they're carrying this activated mitochondrial DNA and give it to the pharaohs and the priest kings of old so that they could go into an altered state and they could be part of that aliveness and remembering whilst it lasted. And then once everything had worn off, they're, they're back to normal. So this is what I'm talking. I'm giving hints and bits and pieces here, but yes. I know for a fact that those who are carrying this, their body will be lighting up like a Christmas tree. Indeed, indeed. And I'm noticing that as well, that those of us who are carrying this or have the language I use is we've done our inner work sufficiently. We've devoted ourselves to our divine feminine awakening. We are activated at this time. The, the creativity that's pouring through me right now is, I'm like, wow. <laughs> and I see it with many others. Mm. The the image you have of it sometimes being remembered and sometimes going underground is very much like a body of water that through the mountains may go underground and then come back up. Yes, very mm. nice, like a subterranean river. Yes. Which yeah. we have here. There is one in particular. Yes. Ah. Very nice. nice. Yeah. yeah. So what would you say about, so it, we are going through this initiation. Mm. What would you say is coming to you as something that might be waiting for us on the other side of this initiation? I was only talking about this yesterday. I cannot, me personally, I cannot see anything to do with human society at this moment. All it is is white. It's a white page. <laughs> There's nothing there. But the, it's a benevolent nothing there. It's not a doom and dreaded nothing there. It's just totally unknown. But I am distinctively noticing things in and around the house, the nature, because we live in nature. There are way more birds, like little... Um, wagtails and robins, way more birds in the garden. And considering we have a very boisterous cat, that's quite something. There is a heck of a lot more birds of prey circ circling the area. And every time we go out for a dog walk, nature is shimmering. There is this added quality. It's like the fifth element or the, or the 13th <laughs> quality not that those numbers mean anything but there is something different in the atmosphere of the natural world and when i notice that it makes me smile my heart warms and it expands so i there's something inside i'm holding on to which is which sounds something like goodness is here and it is crafting the new earth. Wow. Where us humans come into it yet, yeah, I cannot see or sense anything. Mm. Wow, 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 wow. I've, uh, here in Sedona, I'm also in nature, and I've noticed uh, more of a, I love birds. I'm, I'm always a bird person. The birds inform me in the morning what time it is. Yes. By what, who's which who's calling now um 
I would say more of a delight. Delight is the word like a, a feeling of like a childlike delight yeah. that I haven't had before. And I have very close in my neighborhood, like literally a two minute walk, this, you know, we have the red rocks here in Sedona, this little promontory. And I just go there and I lay on the earth under the, under the sky and under the sun mm. every day that I can, which is almost every day. Uh, and just ask to be connected and just love on Mother Earth. Mm. And it does feel like there's something like there's like, I can just be at peace with the Earth, just this communion. Yes. Mm. Yes. Delight is a, is a really good word. And, and yes, there's like a, there's a, like a little skip in the step. You know, the, the weight of adulthood isn't there first thing in the morning. It's like, woo, and then of course you remember, and it's like, ooh, <laughs> you know, the pandemic and the news and the headlines, but my actual essence upon waking, waking up is childlike. Mm. That fog of ugh, adulthood, yeah. it's not there anymore. Mm. Wow. It's very strange because, you know, we are in a, a very frightening situation. It's the heaviest of the heavy. Yes. And global. Yes. I mean, just the fact that there's enough global power on this planet to lock down an entire planet is also something to give us deep pause. Yes. Yes. And, uh, and yet, this is that feeling of like, this is why we came here. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I definitely, each woman I'm interviewing for this series and all of my sister friends who are doing the inner work, even though sometimes the fear may rise. Mm. For me, it's the middle of the night. I notice more. Mm. The mornings are better. Uh, the day is good. And then sometimes if I wake up, I can feel it like, oh, heavy, heavy. And yeah. then I just, I really lean into the goddess. I lean into the divine feminine energies to divine mother Yes. and uh, come back to I came for this absolutely mm. yes I was exactly the same at the beginning of the lockdown oh my god the nights were oh, flip unbelievable the kind of stuff that was going through the mind one of the things I recently shared with my community is the reminder that right now we are all the time we're tapping into the collective. So those of us who walk a sacred path, who don't watch the news, who don't watch what we call the fear porn, mm -hmm. uh, who, don't, who don't indulge in movies about Armageddon, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, nonetheless, we are part of the collective. And this is a time when it's very easy to to tap into that so that such that fears might arise for us related to our personal life, not yes. necessarily the big thing or the big thing. Yes. Either way, it's that grounding and centering back into our, our sacred practices, mm. our, our knowing of our true divine nature mm. that brings us back to the place of, oh yeah, I'm on my spiritual surfboard and I'm going to ride this because that's what I came to ride. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. so to that end i know that you have a, a blessing and a, a, some some gift for us an experience for us absolutely. to help us ride this time absolutely so i'm just gonna mute myself and let you take it away all righty let me just do a little tilt here so you can see my hands okay so this is what i've been doing every morning ever since um, I sit cross-legged and I have my hands out like this, but a little bit lower down near my thighs. Now in my right hand, I imagine the energy, the personality, the character that I am calling the one who is born ready. The part of me who knows that I opted in for this time, that came equipped has constantly connection with all the resources that are needed. A part that's actually a little bit excited because it's like, finally, this big mammoth change is happening and she's ready to go. <laughs> now in the right, left-hand side of me is my human part 
the grief I was talking about, my I'm separated from my parents. My parents are in the UK, they're elderly. So whew, that was a hard one because if they go into hospital, I won't even be allowed to go. I won't be allowed to cross the ocean from France to England. So that's been oh, <laughs> working away. Um, so it's, it's our human, fragile, vulnerable, scared, anxious, worried about money. What kind of society are we going to emerge into? And so I sit like that, knowing that I'm holding both. Now, the left hand side of me goes first. She is going to cross that midline and pick up that right hand that is born ready and bring that hand by her own merit and steam to the midline where despite being afraid and anxious and confused, she gives up all of her energy to acknowledge, recognize, witness, and accept that the right hand side is born ready. And this is what it came for. And you even go so far as dropping your right shoulder and you just really relax into, oh my God, the one who is afraid has the power to hold me. Honor, see, and appreciate why I came at this time. And then that left hand will put the right hand back and come across to the other side where that right hand now is even more inspired, more energy, more empowered. And of course comes across, picks up the left, brings the left to the midline and sort of somatically speaks to that left hand saying something along the line of I've got you and I'm never going to drop you. I am going to hold you through this with great ease and pleasure. I know you're afraid. I know you're anxious and you want certainty and you want answers. Well, all of that is coming in right now through my presence. If only you would let go, left shoulder, let go and trust that I've got this. And there will be physical jolts and letting goes and probably a heck of a lot of emotion as well. And then that right hand will put that left hand back into place. Then you just hold a, a shape of balance, knowing that inside of you a sacred marriage, an actual matrimony is happening. So your midline is the altar. These two are marrying. You could even go so far as to put rings on fingers. So this afraid piece is never on her own. And this born ready piece always has the witnessing of the afraid piece. And you just literally zip, zip those two together. And that is a beautiful steadying practice first thing in the morning. So, so beautiful. Thank you. Deep what you could connection. do, another, another element, when you're holding the right hand, you could play a piece of music that's very sort of victorious and courageous. I'm thinking, you know, something from Gladiator. And then when you pick up the left hand, it's very tender, 
like a like a delicate piano piece something ambient because you want the tears to come and you also want that knowing to just rise up your spine and uh, you know you want it to be palpable inside of your body yes and this is this is so it is the anchoring it's the anchoring we would say in in nlp neuro linguistic programming yeah. And so essential in these times. Thank you for this beautiful and very self-empowering sacred practice. Oh, I have I have a very big morning practice, but this one's going in for sure. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we we all need it. It's part of our self-care. I, I can see this is, you know, whatever works for us, but the self-care is especially important right now. Yes, yes. Mm. Oh, thank you so much for this beautiful time together. Mm, yeah, thank you, Dawn. So mm. if people want to get in touch with you to find out more about your work and get connected, how can they do that? What's the best well, way? Well, in all the usual places, really. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. My website is my name, com. Same for uh, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. You'll find me. Great, beautiful. Well, again, my thanks for the blessings of your wisdom to this series. It's more important than ever in these times. And thank you, sisters, for being here, for holding space around the earth as a sister circle. These are the times we came for. Let us lift as we rise. Please stay tuned for all of these conversations, these sacred gatherings that you may feel the support of this worldwide sisterhood i thank you and many blessings thank you bye for now